Hello, everybody. Welcome once again to another installment of A Rebel Without Applause, coming to you as I always do from my little nutshell of infinite space right here in the wood of the holly. And today I have a special guest. She is, well, she's many things. The main thing she is, is an artist. And the canvas that she paints on is her own life in a really spectacular way. Beyond that, she is an athlete, an entrepreneur, an influencer, and all things cool. And most importantly, one of the most beautiful surfers I've ever seen. She's with me on the other side of this digital divide. There she is, folks, smiling in all her glory with her surfboards right behind her. Welcome, Cassia Medor. How are you? Yeah, good, Bill. Thanks so much for having me. It's a little different than the last time we saw each other, which was out in the water doing one of our favorite things. Yes, surfing. I've seen you. Let's see. It's been a couple of years I've been sort of chasing you in the water. When are you going to do my podcast? When are you going to do my podcast? I guess it was a couple of swells ago at Malibu that I saw you last and we finally nailed it down. I, I think that's actually how we measure time. Surfers measure time, not by the, you know, the rotations of the planets, but by swells. That's it. And yeah. definitely the rotation of the moon, I think, has has to do with that. You know, I, it was like in May, which was springtime and everything was in full bloom. The waves, the mountains, the hillsides, like wild mustard and just exploding with spring bloom. It was so awesome. I'm from the Valley. You're a little bit Val adjacent in uh, Westlake. Is that right? Yeah, like Agora Hills, Westlake, like so kind of Valley. I mean, we called it the Valley, I guess, San Fernando Valley, right? Mm -hmm. Like, but the Valley has like different tones to it and different kind of divides. There's like the Valley Valley or there's kind of like the Valley kind of like that Valley, which is still San Fernando. But, you know, Valley is the Valley. If you're not at the beach, you're over the hill. And if you're over the hill, you're the Valley. <laughs> right. I remember so distinctly when I was, I was not a surfer in high school. I was too busy trying to get to Berkeley and make the baseball team. But I do remember distinctly the spray paint on the rocks, especially right before you got in or out of the tunnel, which was Val go home. And I go, why, why do I have to go home? I want to go to the beach, you know? <laughs> totally, totally. The, the canyons were the portal and definitely the Val's go home was was always the writing on the wall. But then again, at the end of the day, you know, everybody was a valley at one point because it was that like the those trailblazers who made those canyon pathways down to the beach that we get to still drive these days. Absolutely. I mean, I've had my first sort of initiation there and, you know, people would say, you know, get out of here, dude, go back to Sunset, go back to the Val. And I said, dude, unless you're Chumash. I don't want to hear about it, you know, because <laughs> we're all visitors at uh, Malibu. I mean, we're all visitors everywhere anyway, you know, it's like the flora and the fauna can't tell us all to bail. A lot of the creatures, you know, the animals, like I walk around my neighborhood all the time and there's all these epic little skunks that cruise around and they're so funny. And I'm just like, man, you guys were just hanging here for so long. Oh, know? yeah. Like I live in the Hollywood Hills, I can see the Hollywood sign out my window. And, you know, we had a mountain lion that was here for, I don't know how many years, P-22. He recently mm, ventured yeah. to the other side, skunks, raccoons outside my window. I've always had a lot of respect for urban wildlife because somehow they've managed to coexist with us in the shadows. Yeah, I love the urban wildlife. There's a, there's a walk that I like to do that's by where I live. Like it's this loop trail that goes by Loyola Marymount because I'm here on the west side. Uh -huh. And uh, one day I saw a turtle there laying eggs. Well, that cuts to a theme that I feel is integral to Cassia Surf. And that is when humans take remedial actions, things actually can get better. Things can improve. I hear that, you know, and, and I feel that deeply, right? It's like, sometimes, unfortunately, we have to go out of balance to know what balance is. And I feel that humans and humanity um, as a species has been totally out of balance. And we are aware of that out of balance-ness. And I really am hopeful and, um, you know, enthusiastic towards us now because we have the reference of what it feels to be like out of balance and what that means for the planet and for all life forms on this planet, that we have the opportunity to choose to come into better balance. And so, yeah, it's like, 
the technologies here, the wills here. It's just if we all choose to do so, I think we can make a lot of wise choices and pull things back into um, harmony. Well, I can remember as a kid just playing sports in the valley. You know, there were many days where you couldn't play or you didn't. It hurt because of the what the, the smog alerts. I haven't seen one of those days in 20 years, uh, with the exception of when we have big fire events. And uh, similarly, in the Santa Monica Bay, when they've improved the sewage treatment, the life comes back. I'm a diver. I've pretty much scanned all of scuba dived all of like from uh, Latigo up to Big Doom. And I've seen just an explosion of of life that wasn't there. So there's hopeful signs out there. Totally hopeful signs. And that's something that we do for sure. It's like, okay, you know, we're a 1% for the planet company with Cassia Surf. And we actually double down and put 2% back towards our world's oceans by donating directly to Sea Trees. And Sea Trees is involved with supporting our oceanic surf ecosystems by protecting and reseeding kelp forests here off the California coast and worldwide. They also work with mangrove forests. So, you know, that's a huge sequester of carbon. As you know, as a diver, you know, the kelp forests are like the wonderland under the sea that exists that like all these fish and hopefully otters, depending on where you are. You know, we don't really have otters, unfortunately, this far south anymore. Yeah. But when you're up north, you have the otters. And it's just so cool to see thriving um, ecosystems. And especially, I mean, you know, kelp in healthy conditions grows up to two feet a day. So what? if you think about you give a little space for that to grow and what can happen because of that. So that's just super awesome. Well, speaking of kelp, one of the things, and we're going to talk about Malibu and First Point, but just since you brought it up, there used to be very thick kelp beds right at First Point. I mean, many times on the low tide, I can remember flying off my board when my fin, you know, hits a kelp thing. Uh, but I don't see the kelp anymore. And I see instead this kind of Saragossa weed that has sort of found its, it's sort of replaced the Cali kelp. I did some reading about it, and apparently that's from Japan. And it came on the bottom of boats and stuff like that. And I'm, I miss the big bulbous kelp. There was like a huge uh, warming event, unfortunately, in 2012 to 2015. And that kind of warm glob that came through California from up north all the way down south, essentially what it did was it was too warm for the giant starfish. And it was also too warm for the kelp and the giant starfish. So there was like multiple things that happen, right? So mm -hmm. you take one animal out of the environment and out of that ecosystem. And that is like a crucial element to that ecosystem and keeping everything in balance, right? So those giant starfish, their food were the little purple urchins. And those little purple urchins go into zombie mode essentially and eat all the kelp. Well, when there's too many purple urchins and they don't have a predator, which was the giant starfish, then they just go crazy and they create what's called urchin barrens. And so not only did that giant heat blob that came through, you know, on the last kind of like El Nino cycle that we had, that was a huge die off for the kelp as well as the giant starfish which then ate the purple urchins enough to keep them in balance. You know, there should be one or two urchins every like three square feet, you mm. know? Um, and there's just right now I went diving, you know, the other day with the people from the Bay Foundation and there was just urchins eating other urchins. They're in zombie mode. They're just like eating for the fact of eating because they just don't know what else to do and there's nothing to keep them in check. So Part of their work is going in and culling urchins to bring more of a harmonic balance to them, mm -hmm. as well as reseeding those kelp forests that died off. Well, I, one of the things I like to do when there's no surf, which late last weekend there was no surf. Uh, I don't know. We you were. I don't know if you were here, but they had the uh, the, the surf contest for the ladies uh, at Malibu. And it was double over toe. So, I mean, there really was hardly a way for them. So I just got my sup and I just go tooling around. I like to go up and, I, you know, it's a wonderland. Um, dolphins were spinning beneath my board and, and jumping around me. And then I like to kind of go all the way up and then back down around from Nobu and then sort of reverse shoot the pier, you know, very slowly. And I can say this, that those starfish have returned. Mm-hmm. 
Cause well, it's good. You know, it's, it's like things are coming back into balance. And, and again, it's like, we, we help out a little bit cause we notice what happens when there's not balance and then we can help things go back into balance. So yes, it's great that some of those larger starfish are returning and, you know, there was a big die off and hopefully there's not another one because the water will be quite warm this year. And yeah, it's just, it's, you know, dynamic, this planet. It's constantly in flux. There's a lot of my fellow surfers who act as if that wave has been there since the Permian period, you know, 500 million years ago, when in fact, everything is changing all around us. Nothing is what it was or perhaps what it will be. Totally. Yeah. Everything's in flux. You know, it's like, I always trip out on like the old animations of, of, um, well, they're not old animations. They're like animations, like renderings of the evolution of the planet, you know, and, and within the last hundred years, I heard something, a geobiologist who was saying that within the last hundred years, we did something like speed up that process, like, you know, over a hundred times. That said, everything is in transition constantly. Right. But as you just so aptly mentioned, things are in, in transition at a pace that the evolution might not be able to keep up with. And that's where we have extinction events. And I'm surrounded by some of my favorite extinct friends here. Uh, yeah, the dinosaurs. Well, they were roaming up in the Hollywood Hills, like in, you know, before this, like, probably before this last ice age, right? They were just like right, cruising. They were, Mammals. So yeah, when we go back to the Pleistocene era, we're talking. Yeah, we're L.A. was as wild as the Serengeti Plain. Dinosaurs last visited the Earth. I'll show you, sixty-seven million years ago. So they they these are little dino bits that I found in um, South Dakota. I was on. Oh, cool. Uh, these these are. This is probably a rib section from an unknown creature, but it's so cool. It lived at a minimum 67 million years ago. The Pleistocene era was an area of what we call mammalian megafauna. So the La Brea tar pits are filled with those creatures. And they're like just yesterday. Yeah. And I've often thought that L.A. was as wild with huge creatures as the Serengeti Plain in Africa. And here we are living in their shadow. And, and the coyotes, and they're like, they were here. They were there then. They, they kind of made the transition i often wonder if the waves did too probably you know malibu is such a refined point break you know first point it's, malibu it's such a refined point break and refined point breaks come with more time you know the more time that water and like everything has moved in a certain way you know which is also even why like like an island like the big island mm -hmm. of hawaii it's the newer island so it doesn't have as much surf as some of the older islands you know i think about right. that often think of thinking about Indonesia and it's like whole chain of islands, you know, at one point, yeah, a long time ago, it was part of the larger continent of like the greater Asian continent that said like, you know, for so many hundreds and millions and how even, know, who even knows how long, I mean, people do, I don't right now. Mm -hmm. um, it's made for more and more perfect waves. So how did Malibu find you or you find Malibu? <laughs> Man, like, what was that movie? The How Do You Get to the Boo? I went, yeah. I, I got to the Boo uh, through the canyon because, again, okay. I'm a valley kid. Me too. Um, and yeah, you know, my dad, uh, my dad grew up in Downey. And so he was a surfer. There was a whole crew. There used to even be like a Downey surf club back in the uh -huh. day. Oh, there was wow. a surf shop out in Downey. And um, they would, him and his buddies would take Beach Boulevard, which was a different trip then, right? Down to the beach. And they'd be in the beach in 45 minutes. It probably takes you from Hollywood 45 minutes to get to Malibu. Right. So it would take them about the same time, 45 minutes, no traffic, Beach Boulevard from Downey. The beach seemed a lot closer back then. Makes sense, right? So they would go surf like, um, Seal Beach and, you know, through all that whole zone, Huntington a lot, down at Sano. So he was a surfer and he was always listening to the Beach Boys. And definitely like I got into those kind of like older movies, like Gidget, of course, come on, you know. Yeah. Um, good old Kathy inspiring, you know, the planet basically with her stories and, mm -hmm. and that kind of romantic fantasy of what it was like to be a surfer. And it's really that romantic fantasy that got me involved and in wanting to be a surfer. So 
um, we would go on like a family vacation to San Diego every year. At that time, I was convinced that there was gold in the water there because all the pyrite would just be kind of floating around on the <laughs> yeah. inside. And I'm like, it's cold. Oh my God. So the, the ocean was just this like whimsical wonderland for me. And coming back, you know, every year I'd always want to go down to the beach and our closest beach was Malibu as a kid and Zuma, you know, being on the other side of Canaan. Um, and we'd go down to Malibu every now and again. I remember swimming across the lagoon as a kid to get to the other side of it. Um, my dad really did love San Diego to surf, but he would surf in the weekends on the, on, you know, a lot of his surfing buddies at that point were like in different places, but he would always get out there. So I kind of showed an interest in the music and the movies and the lifestyle and, you know, wanted to go surf with him and I'd be out on my boogie board, just splashing all day. And I was like, I want to surf. I want to surf. And his whole thing was like, hey, you know, like learn the ocean and then let's go surfing together. So when I was 14, I did junior lifeguards down at North Beach, Leo Carrillo, mm -hmm. um, and just learned the ocean was running and swimming and learning about rip currents and tides and all these cool sea creatures. And at the end of junior guards every day, you know, there was like three lifeguard boards and it was like you know king or queen of the board it's like no leashes no nothing we'd surf heavens because mm -hmm. that was at north beach and then if you fell off the board other kids would run and grab it so it taught you to stay on the board and <laughs> yeah. hold on to it and that was my first summer surfing was was at the end of junior lifeguards every day and then we'd surf at you know, Leo Carrillo. And then that next summer is when I started going down to Malibu. I think I did summer school and in Calabasas. And then I would get a ride to First Point. And then my my dad would pick me up on his way home from work. So I just basically got dropped off after summer school every day at First Point. And I was just this wayward kid. And uh, everybody at the Palapa, like Josh Farbro and you know, Dylan Jones, Eric Gross, they were like, who are you? Come hang with us, you know? And then I just started chilling with those guys. So it was a very welcoming vibe for you. Totally. Super chill, super rad. They had, you know, Drew was down there. They had the Palapa, you know, cemented in at where oh, yeah. now the lifeguard tower is at first point. The lifeguard tower that's right by, you know, um, the Adamson House fence. Mm -hmm. That was our Palapa. Right. And there used to be a volleyball thing up there. It was a volleyball thing, like right in front of the Adamson house. It was another volleyball net in front yeah. of that main tower towards the pier more. I mean, there right. was just so much more beach. Yeah, there was. It, was. it has changed. To me, it's one of the most inspired playgrounds on earth. It's one of the most beautiful waves smack dab in the middle of this urban megalopolis that's 30 seconds from the highway. I mean, it's like, it's valet surfing, basically, the way I look at it. For me, I remember just, I was always diving and always drawn to the ocean. And I had a kayak, I'd have to go fishing. And I just kept going by first point. And I'm thinking, that wave is so beautiful. And I don't even surf. If I die and God says, well, where did you live? I, I lived in LA. Do you ever drive by Malibu? I go, yeah, all the time. He goes, you surf my wave, didn't you? And I go, well, no, I was, and he goes, get out of here. So, yeah. get out. I of love here. that. Now, being this Gidget or, you know, this lady surfer, did you find that there were more obstacles to just being accepted because of your gender or, or not? No, not at all. I was embraced just like anybody else down there. I almost even think a little bit more, you know, I didn't get heckled as much. People used to get heckled. I remember one time they duct taped Dane Peterson to the Palapa naked and that same thing happened to Eric, you know? So yeah. I think the guys got hazed a little bit more back in the day. Um, and us girls, they wouldn't haze us. They were just like, Hey, come hang out with us. Like, Oh, here, you want to get better at surfing here? Try this, try this, do this. You know, it was a very inviting and supportive environment. I got nothing but encouragement and support from the community down there. And, you know, they were heckling the guys, but I think it was just out of like, because they loved each other and they were all friends. And it was like, that's what happened. I don't think anybody could get heckled now because somebody's parents might get really upset and sue somebody. Oh, yeah, but... Bullying. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Well, I was. It was a good natured heckle. It wasn't anything mean, you know. I got, uh, what do you call it, hazed. There was all the MSA people that were like, because I was maybe a little too aggressive and just trying to get ways. And But most of those people, 
they're now like my really good friends. I mean, you know, here's the deal, right? If you show up to a place and you're not being respectful, you know, there's a there's a level, and I'm not saying that you weren't being respectful, but some people just don't know, right? They're out there trying to get the waves. They don't know that there is a whole kind of talking about ecosystems. There's a whole ecosystem that's in collaboration out in the water. You know, right. a lineup is its own ecosystem. And sometimes if you go into an ecosystem without knowing kind of like the the order of it all, it can be like a little bit out of balance, right? Again, going back to kind of like those things. So then it's like, oh wait, there is a flow. There is an order. There is a kind of like etiquette that happens out here. And, and when that etiquette is followed, then everybody's getting waves. Everybody's having a good time. It's a vibe, you know? Yeah. Um, and I think sometimes for lack of awareness, people that are sometimes newer to surfing, especially later in life that might know the ocean or they're fit enough to catch waves, maybe they just aren't aware because it's a new environment. You know, so it's a whole different language that people aren't maybe like savvy to. In my case, there was, uh, I was Chris Ortega said, do you check the internet? This is when message boards were kind of around. It was a little bit older and you're YBG. I go, I'm who? You're YBG, your yellow board guy. Cause I had a yellow board and nobody oh, knew yeah. my name. And all of a sudden he goes, here, check this out. And it's like, he did this and he did this. And all these people are like, <laughs> like what the hell and then you know i had a few moments and then it was it was fine you know it was it was kind of it was a game back in those days i it was nowhere near as tough mm. the world mm. that i had to navigate in hollywood and particularly in nightclubs comedy clubs because i've been a stand-up my whole life and totally whatever yeah. happened at the beach was nothing compared to what I experienced at the improv and the comedy store and some of those other places. So it was just fun. But I hear I'm, that though. The thing for me in surfing is I just had so much fun being bad. Like this is fun. I'm learning. Mm -hmm. It's fun. It didn't, I was really not result oriented. It mm -hmm. was just process oriented, which is a good lesson for all life. I thought, because you kind of end up having to fail your way to success in life. There's no path to success through success. It's through trials and failure. Now, one of the things that's so impressive to me about you, besides the elegant backside cross step and this adventurous life is that, that you have put together for yourself, is that you have one maneuver that a lot of surfers, no matter how good their ability, have not really managed to get together. And that is the smile. You do it always with a welcoming smile, which lends to me a deeper meaning to the whole surf endeavor. And you have embodied that. And it seems like it flows right into your uh, Casilla Surf and your business and the whole lifestyle that you're a leader in. Oh, right on, Bill. Thanks so much. And and yeah, I think, you know, the ocean and just being in collaboration with nature, flowing in fluid dance with nature and this massively beautiful element, um, which is water and the ocean, you know, it just brings me so much joy and gratitude and peace. And like, no matter what, it's like that joy and gratitude and peace is definitely what I feel that I can only naturally exude when I'm like out there. And mm -hmm. it's just like comes out of me. Like I can't not smile. I'm just so freaking stoked. And when people are out in the water, kind of like grumbling and stuff, I'm like, <laughs> really? Like, you yeah. know, and, and too, I work with sound and vibrational therapy and, you know, water is like a conductor of energy, right? Like it, that's why like it, you can't drop a piece, you know, a, an electrical wire in the water. It would electrocute everyone in the water because it transmits energy. So I always really am conscious of radiating that joy and that gratitude out into the ocean, because I feel that that truly just helps make the world a better place and everybody out there, right? So just even you saying that and reflecting that is is like a testament to that because you're feeling it, you know, just by being in it. And it's, I think it's contagious. Like, let's make good things and positivity and love and joy and, 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 you know, community contagious. That's what's up. Yeah. Well, you, you embody it. And it's interesting because surfing at Malibu is a competitive experience. There's only so many waves and there's always a lot of people and it's finding the balance between the aggression to get the waves and competing for them, but not being a hog, you know, and I feel like that balance 
especially if you're going to be there 60 days a year, you know, what you do one day is going to be, you know, there's payback another day. And it's always sort of finding that balance of being able to re read waves and wave riders and being cool. And you're an elite professional surfer, but there is no vibe coming off like she's using her ability to get more than maybe what feels fair. And we see other examples of that, that they kind of aggravate you over time. There's definitely that thoughtfulness of like, always, you know, never take what you need and always give back more than you take. And I feel like that's, you know, how I try to live my life to always give back more than I take and to only take what I need. And then we're in balance. And I think that if we can all bring that simple principle to our life, you know, humanity would be in a better place. You know, I feel that it is like that greed or that like, I need it all mentality that has put us into a place of out of balance, you know, because it's like we're out of balance and we're out of bounds because we're out of our natural rhythms and cycles. There's plenty for everyone. Of the 9 billion people on the planet, a billion don't need to be starving. Right. I always say surfing doesn't build character, it reveals it. You can see into a lot of people's souls out there. Um, that's what's up. Yeah, that's a, <laughs> it's a really good reflection, but it is. It, it shows your style. It shows your character. You know, mm -hmm. like the, the ocean is like, you know, a giant mirror, really. Yeah. Now, one of the things that's so impressive is we talk about canvases and art. And you, to me, I look at your life and it's an incredible, it's almost, it is a work of art. I'm curious about how you went from the professional surfer vibe competing in the the ladies longboard circuit and being one amongst the best and to finding your niche as an entrepreneur and marketing this freedom vibe i think it was just like a natural progression right just like when we're in the ocean we're like naturally progressing to like bigger waves sitting further out the back riding different equipment you know it's like mm -hmm. you kind of learn your way to and through different elements and a lot of that is like what you're saying before, like eating it, taking some big wipeouts and like building some more elasticity and resilience. And I felt like I just got to where I could grow as a person and as a character and as like my own, you know, self through being a professional surfer. I was so grateful for the opportunity to travel, to see so many places and literally to just make a living surfing. Yeah. But then I just felt like, gosh, like I can, I've gotten, I've reached my peak, you know, like I wasn't trying to like win a contest and what's that for anyway. I wasn't trying to be like the best surfer in the water. I was just trying to like learn and grow and evolve. And I was like, man, I want to do more. I felt like I could only go so far as a professional surfer. So mm -hmm. it's like, what do I have to contribute? What do I have to give back? Also, you know, working for a giant corporation and corporate sponsors, there are super awesome benefits to that. And I'm so grateful for all that time. And then it also felt like it was like, you know, right after that kind of like last little, you know, economic dip and a lot of things were changing. And, and I just felt like a little just out of rhythm with my big sponsors. Like I'm like, man, you know, I'm growing up, I'm seeing kind of like our first world consumerism and how it's affecting the natural landscape. It's affecting the water. It's affecting the earth in a horrible way. I want to do better. I want to make better. And that's, you know, those are some of the reasons I left. And did I have any idea what I was doing? Totally not. You know, I had made wetsuits for about six years for my big sponsor, you know, and I was with them for about 15 years, you know, so I was excited and inspired to make wetsuits. I love taking photos and I love speaking authentically from the heart. And I was like, well, I don't know what this all means, but I need to push myself. And I know if I stay here, I'm not going to continue to evolve and I'm not going to know where I can, you know, it's like staying in the kiddie pool your whole life. You're like, well, mm -hmm. what's it like to dive into the ocean? So I kind of haphazardly, I guess you could say, just dove into the ocean. I was like, it was time for my contract renewal. I was like, thank you and no thank you. I'm going to try to start my own thing where I could make all my choices based off what I want to do. 
And maybe those choices are going to be a good thing. Maybe they're going to be a a learning lesson. I'm going to wipe out a little bit, but if I don't go, I won't know. And so it was kind of that energy that got me to leave professional surfing and start my own company, as well as start to like teach people. You know, it's like I host all these retreats. I get to connect with people. I get to see those connections with other people, inspire other connections. Like so many people I know left their corporate job after they came on retreat. I'm not saying you're going to come on retreat with me. You're going to like leave your partner, leave your job and change your life. But I've witnessed that happen time and time again. And then being able to witness people after that, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is freaking amazing. So it's just awesome to be like really of service and support and be able to teach some people like cool things about surfing. Like this is awesome, you know, like right on, but then also see how that translates. Cause as you mentioned, you know, there is that kind of mirror, you know, surfing shows your character. Um, I also feel like surfing shows our opportunities where those opportunities to grow and evolve and change, you know? So it's like, I don't want to say our character deflects, but maybe like the things that we can move through, like it can expose like our shadow stuff or, or the content that we have to work with to continue to evolve. And, and then by surfing too, it gives us that like resilience and that tenacity to keep going out there and doing it over and over again. So I feel like there's a lot in there and I feel a lot of gratitude for it all. Well, I've seen the wetsuits because I've seen you in the water and those, the beautiful, purple toot on the sleeves and the legs and the designs and i see it on the wetsuits it's all part of the beautification of the beach or your wetsuits and i i've admired them my my only little complaint is how come the girls get to be so pretty i would like a little color in my wetsuit but i i can't find anything my size that is anything but a big black seal with the zipper you know in the back so i totally admire the designs and i've seen you on them many times and They definitely catch my eye in the water. And it goes back to something we talked in the beginning. The material sciences that led to a lot of advancement in World War II fed surfing, whether it was fiberglass, the Clark foam, neoprene. These are like materials that were developed in in other industries that basically made surfing accessible for the masses. It seems like you're part of a a newer revolution in material science for surfing because some of those materials are pretty toxic. Yes, you know, and I think that's the thing, like through the industrial era and like coming out of like, you know, kind of post-war and all these like advancements in materials, we were really working a lot more with chemicals and not knowing what harm they would cause. And maybe some people did know the harm, like, but a lot of people were just like, oh, amazing, plastic. You can put stuff in it. It's great, you know, not realizing that plastic would be in some ways our demise. And, you know, 50, 60, 70 years later, all of us babies are being born with plastic in them because it's in the air, it's in the waterways, it's in all, you know, this stuff. So it's like, okay, cool. So now we're in this place again, where like, we have to know where balance is when we're finding out of balance. It's like, then we have like a reference point, at least like, oh, shoot, I hit a wall here. Okay, wait, what does the other thing feel like? And, and I think there's all these cool advancements and more technology as it's coming out, giving us other opportunities to look into material solutions that are more earth conscious that are softer on our environment and that are just more beneficial to the long term because that's really what it's about and i don't think anything is perfected yet but i think that there's a willingness in all of us really wanting it first and then having the technology to start to develop it and then you know really changing the needle to then having all these kind of like factories and bigger companies being able to start to have it available for us. So I feel like it's like multiple things that that lead to that innovation. But it also goes back to the willingness. And I think as surfers, we're out in the ocean all the time and all drains lead to the sea. So we're out there getting sick. We're out there, you know, feeling the chemicals, literally drinking them, bathing in them. I read a study the other day that said surfers, hikers, people that are outdoors more and connected more with the natural world, if they're walking through a park or they're walking down the street, they're way more likely to pick up trash and and to be kind of like, you know, good stewards of the planet because you're in it all the time. So 
that's the thing that I think is great as surfing is spreading. It's spreading that mindfulness and awareness, right? Like it's spreading because we know what's under the surface, right? Like from the beach, you're looking at the ocean and you're like, wow, it looks vast. It's big. It's blue. It doesn't look like it's polluted at all. But when you're diving in, you know, you diving under the surface, you're like, seeing tin cans, you're seeing trash in the bottom of the ocean floor, you're seeing it either thriving or like not, you know, because you're in it. And I think that perspective of being in it gives us a lot more awareness. And it also gives us the want and knowledge to like push for more conscious products and, and products that are created more soft on the environment of better materials and all these other things. So yeah, I feel like it's like multiple ways. And and in some ways as, as surfers, we're kind of on the front lines. Like a lot of amazing surfing destinations are in developing nations, you know? And developing nations often are unfortunately the rug that first world nations sweep our trash under. Right. So being able to see it, you're like, damn. Environmental imperialism. And you've obviously, you know, you go to the Mentawis and all these places that are so beautiful, but you probably can see the results of it in ways that people that are closer to home don't. Totally, because you're kind of like looking, you know, looking behind the fence in, in some ways, you know what I mean? Like for lack of a better way, it's like, oh, wait, hold on. You know, it's like, oh, we can't have our trash here. Let's get it over to China or like, let's get it somewhere else, just out of sight, out of mind, you know? Well, you're going and swimming in where it's out of mind and it's actually like first and foremost, you know? But then you're like there and maybe you're just doing a beach cleanup and somebody that's from there is seeing some Westerner cleaning up the beaches and they're like, wow, this is making me think. And also that people actually do care, not that we're just everybody else's like trash dump. So you're at once a surf explorer, but you're also, to me, kind of a, a cultural ambassador. Right on. You know, one of the things that to me is so cool about where you and I grew up, Southern California, at the crest of tremendous prosperity, unparalleled in the world, the, the post-World War II generation saw economic growth and wealth that no generations really had seen before. The generations that preceded us they worked their whole lives in farms. They rarely got out of their hometown. Many of them were slaves to the Industrial Revolution in factories. And somehow, with all this, some of these labor saving devices and this wealth that accrued to America, people like Bill and Cassia are the beneficiaries of this moment. And it gets sort of expressed in terms of the possibilities of freedom mm -hmm. and human potential, which mm -hmm. my grandparents didn't enjoy and probably couldn't even consider mm -hmm. uh, not that they were mm -hmm. not privileged but just wasn't in the ether but yet i'm born into this moment where i can go to malibu and surf and i can watch endless summer and look at like well middle class kids can have adventure too it, it's not just a 19th century uh you know romantic thing and one of the things that's so impressive to me about you is that you either I think intellectually and intuitively understand that and are sort of a Pied Piper for it. Because the, the deepest message for me about surfing is freedom and human potential. Not everybody mm -hmm. has to be a surfer and ride waves. Most can't really for a number of reasons, but you embody that and you're free to expand upon it. That's a, a really powerful kind of statement. And it's so true, right? It's like, we're not in a place of having to survive. And what you kind of mentioned, there was a little bit of more of a survival mentality for our grandparents' generation or our great grandparents, you know, coming out of the depression and having to like, you know, a lot of war and just not having like abundant anything. And then us having all this abundant and excess around us, we actually have the space to really think about what can make the difference because we're not focused on just pure survival. And I think that that luxury is really where we're living. It's also something to be grateful for. And there's the time and space to really feel into how can we make it better? Like, how can we really move forward and inspire other people? You know, it's like, I really love that quote from that book, Braiding Sweetgrass, that says, really think about the tree that you plant today and like how the future people can sit in its shade. So like having the luxury to be thinking that way and acting that way, 
I think is a really awesome time to be alive. Mm -hmm. And it also brings me a lot of hope. And that's what I hope also. And I intend to kind of spread and share and invite other people to feel into that way. Because I do feel that I've had the luxury of going around the world. A lot of people are like, oh, like, how'd you learn stuff? And I'm like, dude, the school of life. Surfing brought me all over the planet. And I've seen some heavy stuff. And I've also seen some like amazing things. And through seeing a lot, I feel like I have the luxury of awareness. So we talked about our grandparents' generation. Yeah, a lot of people didn't have the ability to travel. They didn't have the luxury to travel. And with that luxury comes more awareness. And that awareness gives us an opportunity to have more discernment in everything we do and put forward. And it's all for fun too. It's like this joy, this thing I freaking love so much. Surfing brought me around the world and then I can share different things and I can be like an advocate for the world that I want for future generations and also see within my own life, you know? And how can we spread that stoke and how can we spread that joy, you know? Because still, there's a lot of people suffering. There's a lot of people having a hard time. There's a lot of people like maybe not having, you know, things that they're passionate about. Like you love diving, you love surfing. You're going to be wing foiling now. Like there's things that you love to do though. And you're passionate about these things. And there's a lot of people that are still stuck in survival mode. Right. You know, so it's being able to kind of like invite people into the journey for themselves, you know, without making them feel bad or like they're missing out, but invite them in and then also help to spread what we know and share what we know. Which is an interesting thought because a lot of what you do is is made possible and by social media and, you know, you, ha- you have a way to, to reach out. And one of my sort of Airsoft's names for like Instagram is my life is better than your life. And it's almost like sometimes it's competition. I'm almost cautious about posting when, oh, look what I'm doing because I, there's people stuck in their cubicle or grinding to make their rent and, you know, get their kids the medicine. I mean, there's so much human need and wealth disparity out there. So I don't know. There's, it's, it's just the world we're in. It is, you know, and I think it's also like a tool, right? Like it can be a tool and we can work with it and use it and use it to inspire other people and not like a, hey, look at what I'm doing and what you're not doing. So let's like be in a comparison mindset, but like check this out and like invite this in and like take the time for yourself to. And so that's where I try to work with it. You know, I know that there's a lot of people that get stuck in the light counts and get stuck in all this other stuff. And it's like, gosh, the way forward, I feel personally in my, you know, again, limited understanding. Like, I don't know everything. I just know what I know. And the more I I know, the more I don't know. But like in my limited understanding, what I know is that it's, I really feel collaboration is the way forward. Working together, not the me, but the we. If we can not be supporting the divisive nature of things, but working with the inclusive opportunity within all of these mediums and platforms, then we're having it work for us, not against us, right? So by simple things like hiding the light counts so people aren't like, oh, I'm comparing, I'm comparing. You can do things like that, that invite in, like I always try and invite in like inspiring quotes or things I'm thinking about. I share information, but not like this is the way and everybody sucks. It's like, well, I'm learning these things and like, hey, inviting you all to feel into different ways that we can all make a difference every day. Like if the waves aren't good, I'm not going to the beach because I don't need to drive. You know, like I don't need to waste gas, but if the waves are cranking, you bet I'm going to be there. And I always see you there when it's cranking because that's when I'm there. (laughs) So it's like, yeah, these little things that we can do and, and, you know, not like, oh, my life is the best and every day is like a tropical paradise. It's like, yeah, I work too, you know, and I try to be open and vulnerable with people and share my story and just communicate in raw and authentic ways. You know, like I did a post the other day about mental health and how important it is. And it's amazing that I just heard that doctors are now starting to prescribe surfing as a thing 
to do for your mental health rather than pills. Well, the yes. waves are now more crowded with psychos. Great. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, but, no. but, you know, I mean, that's pretty amazing. You know, they're prescribing things like going outdoors, you know, and they're prescribing things that are healthy for you. That's freaking incredible that people are even starting to think that way. People are going into the water when, you know, they're trying to work with addiction or mental health or grief. That's like an awesome tool and it empowers people through being connected with nature. Absolutely. And you spoke about something that's of huge interest to me is this overriding tension in, our, in American and probably human life between our desire for individuality and our need to live inside the collective. Because after all, human survival to this moment is not based on our individual prowess. After all, there's many animals that are stronger, faster than, than, than any human but our capacity to communicate and work collectively is our big survival advantage. And I think American life puts such a premium on individual accomplishment as if, as if that accomplishment is just detached from the larger collective uh, accomplishments of our own society. And we see that in play and surfing is highly individualistic, but to really enjoy it, you have to have a sense of the collective, especially if you live in LA, and there's 50 other people on the same wave. I even think about like the word me. It has a cap on it. But like we is like two open vessels. Oh, interesting. And it can like overflow, right? So I think about that, just how it is, right? And I also feel that, yes, to some capacity, that individual mindset was probably needed at a time to survive. It was probably crucial for our survival at a certain point in our evolution on this planet. Mm -hmm. And we don't need that anymore. It's really about we is the way forward because how we collaborate, how we work together as a global community rather than these like individual nations. Those are the things that I'm thinking about because yes, we are all in collaboration on this planet, whether people want to realize it or not. And what somebody's doing over here affects like people over here. And we're not aware of it, but we all are connected. Just like if somebody's just like every wave is mine and I'm taking off on everybody out here because I need to get mine because I only have this much time and blah, blah, blah. Everybody in the water is going to have a bummer of a time because that person is going to be dropping in on everybody. Most right. likely. It's that kind of idea and that kind of mentality of we, I believe personally, is the way forward. You brought up like America and Americans, the I, right? Like in a way, right? The independent I. And a lot of people, you know, except for the indigenous peoples that were here before anybody, you know, the First Nations people came from somewhere else and abandoned their culture to survive. So everybody who showed up on these shores came to get theirs and had to abandon the communal aspect of feeling a part of a country or a part of a culture to yeah. start theirs and get theirs. So I think it was that spirit and that energy that we're still feeling. And that's, I think, where the opportunity is to see us all as one people. Recalibrating the balance between the I and the we. I mean, we've seen other societies where the we just crushes the I and others where the I can crush the we. And so I think that's a tension that's always in play. We even see it in our, our team sports like basketball, the guy who's the ball hog, but the team loses. Well, what's the point? And we're just always struggling for that balance. I personally, as you are, I can see it. I'm a highly individuated person. That's just, I, I, you know, I couldn't get in a cubicle and I wanted to be a comedian, an actor, whatever, all this stuff. As I see, you are completely self-invented. We are highly individuated. But what's beautiful about Casilla Medor is in spite of your individualism, you understand the larger social need for the collective. And I think that's the thing to spread, you know, and that's the thing to share, right? And that's where collaboration comes in. And we're only as strong as our, our weakest link, right? You know, even the thought of many hands make light work. Yeah, it's light work when we're all working together. So why don't we all collaborate? Right. You know, if you have something like the Olympics, for instance, where all the countries in the world are on the same page about the Olympics and everybody's sending their best athletes to compete against each other to see the world's best in whatever the sport is. Well, 
what if every country was sending their brightest minds to work together and collaborate towards ways to get us all out of this mess that we've created for ourselves? And there was games and sports around it. And it would be like a fun thing rather than a competitive thing. Because oftentimes we know those Olympic athletes after the Olympics, they put their whole life into it. What are they going to do? They beat up their body. They don't even know who they are because all the, their identity is wrapped into this thing that they did. And that's over because it only has like maybe one or two rounds and then you're done. How is that helping anybody? The resources, the energy, the money that goes into the Olympics, them creating these mega cities. We don't have the resources to continue to fuel this thing that's really destructive, actually, and wasteful. So it's like, how do we take that? But that's like really the one thing that everybody around the world is in support of. That's like where we all meet, right? Sport. You know, we. Yeah, support. We saw a little bit of that with COVID. We all kind of were like, oh, shit, there's something going on. Mm -hmm. You know, let's talk about this, you know, but that's where we're all working together. So how do we take that sort of mentality and all get on the same page for what's happening with the planet and like really kind of solving some of the crisis we've put ourselves in? Those are the things that kind of get me amped up. And those are the things that I kind of think about. And those are the things I like to, you know, communicate about. Cause it's like, I mean, I don't know the way. Do any one of us know the way, but together we can find the way forward. You touched on something too. And you were an, a professional athlete. The lifespans on professional athletes are way shorter than the lifespans on accountants and lawyers. It's a shorter window. So professional athletes have this struggle when that time sunsets, figuring out how their life can have meaning. You seem to have, I'm sure not without pain, but you've done it. And it's beautiful. Oh, thanks so much, Phil. Yeah. And, and this is, you know, this is what we're here to spread. And so it's like next time we're out in the water together and we're talking about these things, it's like this conversation, hopefully many people will hear it and it'll give them the inspiration to really feel into those things and think about those things. And I'm a big believer of what's convenient sometimes is the trick, right? Like it was convenient to have a plastic water bottle, yes. but it was the worst thing ever. Mm -hmm. So like when something feels so convenient, you know, like I could have continued to take money from my giant corporate sponsors and be a surfer, but would I put myself into a place of having to figure it out in a different way? You know, we're surfers, right? It's through tension and leaning into the tension that inertia and movement happens. So how can we work with that tension, whether it's in, you know, a hydrodynamic way out in the ocean, whether it's working with the wind, whether like, how can we lean into the tension within our own lives and actually like go flying? The more you load up that tension on the rail and the fin of the board, the faster you're going to go and the more vertical that turn's going to be. And it's going to feel that much more cool, but you have to hold the tension. You know what I mean? Right. Like, <laughs> so I feel like that is something that I, I mean, I feel like surfing has given me so many tools, but I really feel like it's like, you know, even the principles of surfing and like how it even works are things that give me tools. And it's like, okay, like let's load up on that tension. Let's lean into a little bit of the uncomfortable place and, and see what we're made of here. Well, you're made out of a beautiful fiber inside and out. And I want to just thank you, Casilla Medor, for sharing uh, your wisdom and your life experience. And I want to encourage people to check out Casilla Surf. Google it, you'll find it. It's a portal into not only cool gear, incredible travel. I noticed you're going to Morocco, uh, Imswan, a fantastic place. The culture there is spectacular. The history and the Berber culture and the desert and the camels, I love it. But it's, a, it's an incredible portal to activism, fashion, surf, self-actualization, some sound bathing going on there I saw somewhere about Casilla. Uh, so you're riding sound waves and, and water waves and the whole thing. So thank you for just hanging with me. It was so fun. I finally got the quality time I've, I've lusted for all these years with Casilla Medor. Yeah, Bill. Thank you so much for having me. Super stoked and excited to see you in the water on that next good swell. Absolutely. Till next time. Namaste, shalom, and aloha. By that I mean namashaloha. Yeah. Speak.